Thanks, Keith. It's um, an honor to be here. Um, this is my first UK NAF, so it's, um, it's great. This actually reminds me a lot of the early days of, of NANOG, when the group started out relatively small on the order of 40, and it grew to 60 and 80, and that's really an indication of the value that people derive from, uh, from these, these forms. So th this, is, uh, this is terrific. Um, I've spoken at a lot of conferences now, and um, my dad told me I should open my talks with um, a joke. I'll share with you a joke that I, um, I told at the, uh, the Tokyo Peering Forum a few years back. It was the cell phone joke, unless you guys have already heard the cell phone joke. Um, so the, um, these guys finish up their golf round, and they go to the bar. And uh, at the bar, the cell phone rings, it says wife, the guy picks up the phone and says, hi honey, and the wife says, you know, I really would like to buy that watch. I know it's a really expensive watch, this, uh, this boulevard, but I feel like I deserve it. I want to go ahead and buy it. And the guy says, honey, I love you, you deserve it, buy it. And she says, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, I love you. And since you're in such a generous mood, I think we ought to buy that Lexus. It's a really nice car. We deserve it. We've been working really hard. The guy says, honey, I love you. Absolutely. You deserve it. Go ahead and buy it. And she says, oh, honey, I love you. I love you. This is going to be great. And since you're in such a great, generous mood, how about that Lake Tahoe house? It's 2.3 million, but I think we get it for 2.1. Honey, I love you. Offer 2.1, go up to 2.3 if you need to. And the wife says, honey, I love you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. The guy hangs up the phone and says, does anyone know whose cell phone this is? <laughs> so I, I told that joke in, in Tokyo. And, um, you know, the, there's translators in the back of the room translating everything I say into Japanese. Probably 300 people in the audience, all in suits and ties with the headphones on. And after I tell the joke, maybe five seconds passes, and then they all laugh. So I thought, finally, I found a, a joke that works in international forums. But my Equinix colleague at the time said, Bill, the translator said, the speaker has told an amusing anecdote. It would now be polite to laugh. <laughs> So what can I say? I just can't win. My jokes are just not that good. So uh, my name is Bill Norton. I go by William B. Norton primarily. So when salespeople call, I know it's a salesperson because they don't know I'm Bill. And um, I started um, running um, this Dr. Peering website. Uh, Keith mentioned sharing of information throughout my entire career. I've always been all about sharing information. Even back in the NSFNet days, 1988, when I first joined the project, the NSFNet was the topological core of the internet at the time. And when the regional text meetings got everyone together, we all shared information about what was working, what wasn't working, how much traffic was coming into the NSFNet backbone, how much was going out, and whatever problems were happening, we all shared that information openly. And it was a terrific thing. Now, when the commercialization occurred, I became the, the chair, the first uh, chairman. I actually created the name Chair of Nanog because before then, uh, the name that was used was uh, Program Coordinator or uh, Event Manager, and I wanted to be chair. So I was the first chair of Nanog from 1994 to 1998, where the role was very much like this. We brought people together, shared information to the extent that they were willing to share information, and that way helped grow the, the net. Now in 1998, I was recruited to go help launch this company um, that was eventually called Equinix, which as you know today is a, a large global um, exchange point operation, data center operation company. And uh, when I retired in 2008, I tried to figure out what I wanted to do. And um, I don't know if, if you know this, but I started understanding peering myself by coming to conferences very much like this in 1998 and, and before. I asked basic questions of the really smart people like Keith here or like Mike Hughes. I would say, what's the definition of peering that you use? 
Um, how do people decide who to pair with and how do you decide when you don't want to pair with somebody? So the process I used was um, developing white papers. I wanted to have an excuse to ask these questions. So over lunches or dinners or at the bar, I would ask these questions and jot down what they had said. And then I'd walk other people through what the previous people I had said about a particular operations topic. And you know what? After about 100 walkthroughs, I had in my hand a white paper that represented the community mindset on a topic that had not been documented before, like the practice of internet peering or how one chooses an internet exchange point. And I just loved sharing that information with whoever wanted it. And I got invited to speak at conferences much like this. So that gave me the stage to ask the next operations conference. So over the 10 years I was at Equinix, I documented about 10 different internet operations activities that hadn't been documented before. So in 2008, I decided when I retired to rewrite all those white papers, update them, refine them, make them um, cohesive and consistent, and, and that's actually what I have here. The Internet Peering Playbook is really the collective mindset in the industry on the practice of internet, internet peering. In fact, this is the only book in the entire world on the practice of internet peering. And for the 200 of us that care about it, then this is an important book. It a, it's a, is a very uh, micro niche topic. The, the publishers tell me um, this is what's called a, a vanity book. <laughs> because you really won't uh, sell a whole lot. But it actually, speaking of sharing information, uh, put me into being a, a publisher. This, I'm an e-publisher now. I have Dr. Peering Press, if you will. And um, I, I want to share with you a couple things I found interesting, because that's what I look for when I research topics. Um, it turns out that when you um, sell an e-book on Amazon.com, uh, you may notice that most of the books are priced $9.99 or less. Do you know why that is? Because at $9.99 or less, I get 70% royalties. If it, I price it $10 or above, I get 30% royalties. So this is why you don't tend to see books priced between $9.99 and about $17, $20 bucks or so, because the, the royalties are aligned like that which I, I thought that was a rather, rather interesting thing. It's also interesting that I get seven bucks out of the 10 bucks for each ebook, where if I had gone the traditional publishing route, most authors might get a buck. Of course, like I said, the multiples are not particularly large in this space. Um, the, the other thing that I found interesting in, in writing this book and giving talks with different companies around the world is that, you know what, content guys, are increasingly focused now on network performance and the network interactions. And I'll give you a specific example. Working with a large content company in Silicon Valley, I went to lunch at the cafeteria, we had a good meeting, and I, I went to the, the bathroom. Normally over the urinals you see newspapers at bars, right? You know what they had? Coding guidelines for better network performance. <laughs> Check that out. How to figure out whether the API call you're doing is with a local database or a remote database. Call sequences that they want to see used. Holy cow. I mean, I thought that was rather interesting, and it surely is an indication that the content guys are focused a lot more on network performance. And then the last thing I found interesting was when I was giving a talk in, um, uh, in Africa, I've been to all the African peering and interconnect forums now, we learned about some of the obstacles associated with deploying fiber across Africa. And um, one of them was sabotage, that competitors in some of these countries sabotage each other's infrastructure. Another one is when they're uh, actually deploying fiber in the ground in some locations, the peasants are digging up the fiber. Do you know why? They think it's copper. It's fiber, but they think it's copper. They're digging up the copper wires as they've always done. They melt it down to make trinkets to sell on the side of the road. So the response by these new telecom companies is to put fiber in the ground and put Kevlar sheathing around it. So it looks different, and it's also more difficult to, uh, to dig out. But they found that it still happened. What they would do is cut the fiber, tie it around 
the uh, tow bar on the back of a pickup truck and drive the opposite direction. And they would take off the Kevlar sheathing and weave it into bulletproof vests, which sell for a whole lot more than the trinkets they would sell on the side of the road. And again, I, it's, it, it just is interesting because it's different. Every place I've visited and spoken with, there are just slight differences around the world. So I'm going to talk to you about a couple other uh, things that have jumped out recently to me. Um, first is uh, remote peering. It's um, more common here in, uh, in Europe, but in the U.S., uh, not quite so much. So I, I wanted to really understand the business dynamics behind it. So as I did with the white papers, I went out and talked to a lot of folks and asked them about it. And it turns out you have to look at the traditional peering model first to understand the remote peering model and some of the business dynamics. So here we have an ISPA that has a router and wants to go peer into these three uh, exchange points different parts of the world. Uh, so they have to buy a transport circuit into that exchange point to connect to another one of their routers that they go bu often buy. And at that router, they connect up to the exchange point peering fabric, so they have the opportunity, potentially, to peer with these colored networks shown on the right-hand side that are available at the various different exchange points. So I, I asked at the, um, at the European Peering Forum up in Iceland earlier this week, um, rough numbers, what does it cost these days in Europe to do this traditional peering model? And they said, well, you know, it depends on whether you're close or whether you're far away. Um, but if you're far away, a 10 gig circuit into an exchange point today in Europe might cost you $1,500 per month or so. Maybe a little more, a little less, but the math works out easy, so work with me on these numbers. The router that you physically deploy to that um, exchange point in the co-location environment might amortize to about $2,000 per month and the co-location about $1,500. And then the 10 gig peering port in, in Frankfurt, it might be on the order of 2000 per month, giving you a total cost of about $7,000 a month. So you have the ability to peer away as much of the, of the traffic as you have for free at that $7,000. So if you take the best case scenario, if you take that 10 gig port and you fully utilize 7 gigabits per, per second out of that 10 gig, you end up with about a dollar a meg in the traditional peering environment. That's pretty good, right? A buck a meg? That's the best case scenario. That's if you max out your peering infrastructure. So what is the, peer, the remote peering model? Well, the remote peering model is where a provider will actually get you into that exchange point without you having to buy a router or have co-location leases with anybody. So the idea is you extend the peering fabric out to the person's router, wherever that happens to be. And I, I kind of liken it to um, a telephone company. You call the telephone company and you say, I want to buy a telephone service. They don't say, sure, bring down a wire and we'll give you some space. You can buy it from us and then you can get a cross connect to different long distance providers and we'll charge. No, no, no. Telephone company says, sure, fine, I'll bring that to you. Well, that's essentially what remote peering is. We will bring that exchange point directly to your router, wherever that happens to be. So um, the same exact model here, we have ISBA on the left, but a remote peering provider provides a, perhaps a, uh, a 10 gig port or multiple 10 gig ports, and that extends the exchange point out to that provider. So on the right hand side, there's no need for a router, so you don't have that cost. You see over there on the um, spreadsheet, the router cost disappears, and because you don't have router, you don't have colo. So again, the co-location cost disappears. So the end result is about half, is exactly half, the cost of the traditional peering model. Or in the best case scenario, you're down to about 50 cents per megabit per second. And I thought that was, that was interesting. Graphically, it looks kind of like this. And you may have seen this if you've seen any of my white papers in the past or if you, if you have a copy of the book. Um, here you have the, the cost of the <coughs> traditional peering model. This would be your $7,000. If you peer one megabit per second at the exchange point and it costs you $7,000 to do so, that's $7,000 per megabit per second, which is a tad pricey. But if you peer two megabits per second, price drops, $3,500 per meg and so forth, until you asymptotically approach that minimum cost of a buck. 
with a remote peering model, you take away the equipment costs, you take away the co-location costs, and you start at a much lower uh, point. And then you allocate the cost of that remote peering infrastructure across how many megabits per second that you can peer. And the good news is you have a much earlier break-even point where it makes sense for you to, to build into, uh, into the peering point. And again, the reason this works, why does this work? Because historically, the price of transit has always dropped and dropped and dropped and dropped and dropped. And the cost of uh, transport has dropped at a slightly similar rate. The cost of peering ports at the exchange points around the world continues to drop and drop and drop. But these two pieces have not dropped proportionately. The cost of co-location remains about the same as it was five, ten years ago. The cost of routers roughly about the same kind of cost point. So this is the economic reason why remote peering as a model has been uh, taking off. But I'm going to go one step further and argue that because of this, peering is bringing a, a breath of fresh air back into the peering ecosystem. So again, here we see the same graph. In the old days when uh, I, I first met Keith, the, the break-even point might have been you know, 10 megabits per second. That is, if I could convince you, you could peer 10 megabits per second at an exchange point, then I could prove to you financially it will be cheaper for you to do so. But then the price of transit dropped, and now the break-even point shifts over to the right. Well, I'm here to tell you that today, the peering break-even point is pretty close to non-existent because the price of transit is just so low. And as a result, some people are moving out of, of the peering ecosystem. Remote peering, because it brings over the cost of, um, uh, brings down the cost of peering, it makes that peering break even happen sooner and enables us to make that financial cost justification once again. But in this analysis and in talking to people about remote peering and why it works and, and how it works and how various people use it, I stumbled upon something that's actually generically applicable to peering. It's not a remote peering use case. This is actually an argument that I'm going to make and you guys can shoot me down on this. In fact, please shoot down this argument before I put it in the next version of the book. I'm going to make this thesis that peering improves security. And every day you hear in the newspaper about the security vulnerabilities of the internet, I'm going to make the case that peering improves security. You with me? So here's the case. Peering makes it less, makes your traffic less vulnerable to the side effects of denial of service attacks. So if you look at this argument, the nature of the commodity internet is that all traffic is intermingled together. And if there is an attack, a denial of service attack, against somebody completely unrelated to your traffic flow, your traffic might be affected. It might get congested. There might be packet loss that happens as a side effect of an attack against entirely different destinations. So you will be affected. However, if you look at the traffic that is peered, it is effectively segregated away from that commodity traffic and will be largely unaffected by any denial of service attacks that happen out there in the industry. Now over dinner last night, very nice Indian food by the way, um, folks said, well that sounds like a, a resilience argument that Perry makes. Um, it provides a more resilient solution than, than transit. And the counter I think is that, well, I think secured communication from A to Z requires as a prerequisite an unobstructed path between point A and point Z. And if you don't have that un unobstructed path between A and Z, your traffic can't possibly be secured. You cannot have a secured communication without a, a path between point A and point Z. So again, I argue that peering improves security. The second view is that um, peering provides fewer points of vulnerability for a particular path. So here we have uh, ISP A who buys transit, yes, but peers away some of that traffic, in particular with ISP Z, versus ISP A who solely buys transit, and that path might be longer and more circuitous to get to the destination. So what does that mean from a security perspective? There are more points of vulnerability along that path that can be attacked. That makes sense, right? 
not only just for attacking of individual interfaces, which makes the end-to-end -end communication vulnerable, but any one of these points can have packet capturing or man-in-the-middle attacks. There are more points of vulnerability along a longer AS path than there is along a peering path. Now, one of the guys from um, a, a large European exchange point said, well, Bill, you know, the thing is, yes, you could be right between AS's, but really the transport is where people are uh, splicing in, mirroring ports, that kind of thing. That's a, a transport level issue. And I, I countered that saying, well, if you're concerned about the circuits being tapped and packets being captured indefinitely or what have you, I argue there are more points where that can happen and you have less visibility into that traffic tap than you would if it's between you and your peer in a secured co-location environment. Point number three is a practical one. A, a large content company said to me, Bill, probably the strongest argument we have for peering is the fact that when I establish a peering relationship with you, we exchange contact information. In fact, escalation path information. My guys, when there's an attack coming in, know the person to phone when there's a particular problem. And I'll tell you, you don't get that kind of service when you call your transit provider and say, I'm having an attack, it's really affecting me. He has a whole lot of things that he has to deal with besides just your problem. So again, peering improves security. So in, in summary, and we can open up to questions if we, if we have time, um, remote peering is peering without a physical router co-located at the exchange point, and it reduces CAPEX and OPEX, which enables more uh, networks to uh, start peering. Um, it further allows networks to peer in more locations because the cost of doing so is much less. And as I said, I argue that it it is actually breathing new life into the peering ecosystem because more people can come in and peer. And then my assertion, which I, I'm hoping you guys will, will, will challenge and we could have a lively discussion either here or in the, uh, in the break room, uh, that, that peering improves security. Thank you very much for your time. I uh, hope this was interesting. If you're interested in the remote peering stuff, there's a, a chapter in the new edition of this book on remote pairing. I shared some pieces of it. I'd be glad to email a PDF to you guys if you'd like to give it a look and, um, and maybe provide some feedback. And uh, with that, I think we have a little time for Q&A. Thank you, Bill. Um, any questions for Bill? Dave, um, microphone for Dave. Ah, great, Rob. Hang on a second, Dave. Oh, and I, I did bring five copies of my book. I need to figure out who it makes the most sense to give them to. Are there, are there folks who are relatively new to peering? Yeah? Okay, I'll get you one. This is, see me at the break, and uh, like I said, I've got five I can give out. They should, should have had a quiz. <laughs> a <laughs> Not quiz. said that already. Uh, David Friedman from Clarinet. Um, hope this thing's on. I'd, I'd just like to raise a point with regards to your assertion that peering increases security, yeah. um, specifically concerning denial of service attacks. I think it's very architecture dependent because a number of providers, uh, and it's a, a common increasing trend, uh, are designing networks, uh, what's become commonly known as the collapsed core model, uh, where you have a box that's uh, doing multiple functions uh, that's reasonably powerful, relatively cheap, and reasonably flexible. And you'll find a number of providers are plugging peers, public, p and and transit providers into these boxes together. So these boxes actually act to aggregate the sources and the transport of denial of service traffic. Um, and if packets are going to get dropped, it may not be on the peering or transit interfaces. It may be on the interfaces bringing the traffic back into the operator's core network. So the, it's creating an abstraction, really, between... <laughs> Um, what was traditionally considered peering circuits and transit circuits and really um, there's a combined point where a lot of this traffic appears to ingress the network. I know that some operators do this design intentionally for various reasons. Um, they like to have a single place uh, or as few places as possible where traffic uh, enters and leaves the network. So now, I, 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 I want to make sure I understand your argument. You're, you're talking about the one first of these slide, clouds. The first slide that you had. If you go back, back one slide. You see, it's less vulnerable to the side effects of DOS. It's a terrible, messy slide. 
it's <laughs> very, very busy. It's pulling bricks. <laughs> uh, but, but yeah, th th this is the transit provider that is um, right. uh, dropping packets because of a denial of a service attack against yeah, But let's, ju let's just imagine the traffic's now being carried over the peer network. Um, yeah, okay. Yeah, so th the eyeballs are here. Where it comes from the transit provider, and I suspect it's in this sort of beige cloud over there to the right. Oh yeah, that's his transit provider. Yeah. Oh, that's his transit provider. Yeah. Okay, so uh, where, these t where these two... Where the network, where the traffic ingress is, this eyeball network. Are these two places? Uh, yeah, uh, my assertion is that this, uh, in modern networks, these things usually ingress at similar, if not the same points. So the denial of service traffic is mixed between peering and transit okay. onto a single router. If that's the case, uh, we're talking here about the side effect traffic. The traffic that's not destined to this guy or this guy, traffic that's destined to someplace far along the world. And if his transit provider has traffic that is impacting his ability to communicate with him, mm -hmm. then uh, that's, that's a, a different problem. If the, if, this traffic, if the traffic goes across this network, his upstream network, then uh, yeah, this, this backbone can be affected. But since this traffic is going directly between these guys, that should be largely unaffected. Unless you're telling me that somehow this no. peering interface is being affected. But then also, I think it's also worth pointing out that that being the case, if there is a denial of service attack and yep. traffic is ingressing directly, let's now imagine that a denial of service attack directly ingresses from the peer. Yeah. Okay. So you have now have to manage that. Even worse, if that's across a public exchange, you have to manage that. Beautiful. If it's coming through a transit provider, you pick up the phone. Can you filter my port? You probably have more capacity than I to do this. I argue that these guys know each other. When they pick up the phone, they're going to pick up the phone. And this guy can more precisely determine what session and where is this traffic sure. coming from. But he until, can cut off the peering that, session. Until that time, if that's a public peering, there's a, there's a flat Ethernet fabric between me and the peer, and I'm getting frames thrown at my peering router, and I can do nothing about it until I can call that person up and stop it. Okay, now, that's Now, I a don't new have one. a contractual relationship because the bilateral agreement I've entered into means that even if I take the peering down, there's nothing I can do about it. I'm possibly still getting frames thrown at my, my peering router. But, but not through that path. It might be coming through a different path. Right. If this guy's the But target. the point I'm making is it, it's coming through the transit provider. I call the transit provider up. Hello, I'm paying you. Please filter. Does that make sense, Ilya? Ilya Varvashkin, isn't it? We actually have experienced just very recently, about maybe th three, four months ago, uh, that what uh, Dave is talking about. So uh, we had some uh, traffic which was coming over the exchange point, uh, and even it was actually layer two traffic. So it was uh, kind of uh, ARPs uh, which shouldn't have been coming. And they were just exhausting the buffers. Uh, so and so you say uh, one of one of these guys was originating yeah. the attack against. Well, it, it wasn't actually a uh, malicious attack uh, or intentional attack. It was just uh, some uh, bu bug in the router. Uh, so they were sending traffic, which nobody actually wants to uh, to have uh, neither sender nor us. So and you really have very little control of this traffic because you still want to peer with other guys, so you have to have your interface up. I, I still assert that the escalation path and the dynamics between two peers is better than the dynamics between a customer and the upstream transit provider. Uh, be because between customer and transit, probably not much different, probably even better be between customer and the transit than between the two peering partners, because quite many peerings today, uh, they're just made in a way like, uh, okay, do you want to peer with me? Uh, oh yeah, okay, fine. Uh, but if you do something bad, uh, the best I can do is just to de-peer you. Or, or, or just turn off the, uh, the port temporarily until you get yeah. things uh, uh, fixed. Uh, thank you very much, but I, I, it would actually affect uh, much more than just this peer. Because, uh, well, if you try to shut down your port on ARM6 uh, or at links. Oh, not the whole port, just bring down the session administratively. Yeah, but if you bring down the session, that's what we did, uh, it still kept uh, receiving oh. layer 2 traffic. So, because... Oh, from another peer? Oh, no, from, from this peer, they were sending ARPs. Ah, an arc storm, or or is it? Um yeah, uh, no, nobody could figure out why they were sending arps. Uh, so it looked like a bug in the, in the software on their side. Interesting. Yeah, thank thank you. Uh, that's a, quite a specific case. Um, I'm 
being a bit... I'm, uh, no, it's a very good one. A very good one. I'm, I'm being more general about this in that if I take down the session, I force the traffic over transit, right? The, the peering is gone. There is no peering is more secure in that case. The peering has gone. I've taken it down. I have, I'm not going to enter into a bilateral with a peer where I have some kind of legal remedy for mitigating the effects of such an attack. Otherwise, I'm just not going to get the session. They'll say, sorry, too complicated for us to buy. Yeah. With a transit provider, that's an entirely different matter. If I want them to filter and I'm paying them to filter and I have a remedy if their lack of filtering that they've promised me causes me any damage. Interesting. Thank you for that. That's a, that's a very interesting point. Have I stolen all the question time? <laughs> Sorry. One minute left. Any, any more questions? Oh. <coughs> Paul Mansfield, Grape Shot. Uh, we're not big enough to be peering, but um, what advice would you give people uh, in terms of choosing colo and uh, transit providers to avoid getting into peering walls. Uh, if you're quite latency sensitive in, um, in your operations, how can you be certain that if you choose a particular transit provider that they'll always be able to maintain good peering, what's good, they may peer and give you good connectivity today, but how will that change in the future? I'm not sure that there's a single answer as to how to choose transit <laughs> providers um, or even uh, co-location centers. Um, I, I can tell you when I asked the peering coordinators the, the question, how do you choose <coughs> exchange points, um, or actually um, co-location centers slash exchange points, um, I got about 10 different criteria that they're, they're listed in the book, but the essential point is that they were weighted very, very differently. For some customers, they really cared a lot about a particular aspect, like uh, operations, activities, uh, when can I access my equipment at the co-location center. Um, the story that I was told in, in France was the guy you know, flew internationally to get into the France exchange point and at 5 o'clock uh, the security guy comes by and says I need to escort you out. And the guy says I just have about 25 more minutes left and I'm, I'm all set. I'm sorry we are closed, you have to come back tomorrow. Uh, versus locations where 24-7 operations or remote hands are available. Some people care dearly about that aspect. The same is true about transit providers, where your traffic's going to, coming from, how latency sensitive is the application. So a wide variety of criteria that come into play. So it's a hard question to answer. Well, with that, guys, thank you. Uh, like I said, I have uh, some books I can, I can hand out. And send me an email if you'd like to get... Uh, um, uh, the chapter on remote peering, I'd love to have some more feedback. Okay, thank you, Bill. Oops.